background, change yourself. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. A couple of technical pieces to get together, but here we are. Um, I'm Colin Cunningham. I'm from the Centrifuge uh, team and welcome to uh, just another pool party here at Centrifuge. Um, today we have the Flow Carbon team that's going to be presenting and talking a little bit about their pool, uh, their business, and their their journey into DeFi. So we're really excited to have them. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Dana now to kick this off. Uh, they'll present for probably about 30 or 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. Um, so really excited. And Dana, over to you. Thanks, Colin. Can everyone hear me? I'm good. Awesome. Hi, Centrifuge. <laughs> um, we are very excited to be here. We're excited to be introducing the community to uh, what we believe to be a really exciting and high impact asset class, which is voluntary carbon credits. Um, and we appreciate you taking the time to learn about this market, learn about this asset, learn about Flow Carbon and what we do uh, this afternoon. Uh, so today, I think we're going to tell you about what these assets are, where they come from, how they're generated, um, and then how Flo Flow Carbon is working to bring this rapidly growing market on chain to help scale what's known as the voluntary carbon market, um, which is a market that is intended to scale critical climate action. And so we are working as a company to bring much of the carbon value chain onto blockchain. And this pool party, I think, is a very exciting step in doing that um, because it helps finance projects that create carbon credits. Those carbon credits are then sold for revenue, um, which allows these projects to be done. And we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, in a bit. Uh, and so we're working to help finance more projects so that more impact gets done and to then bring the asset class itself, which are the, the resulting carbon credits onto uh, blockchain in the form of tokens. So we're, we're active at every part of the carbon value chain as a company and are actively working to bring this market on chain because we think that's the most effective and transparent way to, to scale it. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and share a presentation with you and uh, introduce some of my team members as well. Uh, so give me a minute. Do you all see my screen? Yeah, is this Colin? Yeah, okay. Perfect, great. perfect, looks great. Awesome, okay. Um, so we're, we're gonna start by introducing the team um, and then introducing the market. Again, this market is called the Voluntary Carbon Market. We'll explain what this market encompasses. Um, and then we'll get into the investment thesis, why we're partnering with Centrifuge, why we think DeFi uh, and Centrifuge in particular are uh, key ways to help scale financing in this market. Um, and then we'll talk about the pool itself uh, and what we think could be uh, some follow-up pools or post-pilot scaling. And then we'll get into Q&A. So uh, excited to start. Let's start by talking about Flow Carbon. I, I did that a minute ago as well, but basically Flow Carbon is a company that is very active in what's known as the voluntary carbon market, which is the market for carbon offsets, essentially. Um, voluntary carbon credits are synonymous with carbon offsets, which is a term you may have heard in the past, and, and we'll get into what that means. But we're active at every step of the um, carbon offset generation chain. So we are active uh, at creating or originating new high quality supply of carbon credits. So helping finance new projects. We are active in helping finance existing projects because um, it often takes time, often years actually, to recover, uh, to recover revenue. And so helping uh, structure innovative financing opportunities for those doing projects uh, is another place that we are very active. And then we are highly active in the spot and forward markets for carbon credits. Um, and in that sense, we are active in a traditional over-the-counter way. And we are also working to bring this market on chain in the form of uh, tokenized carbon credits. And that's one of our flagship uh, products and initiatives. This is uh, 
a representation of some of the important folks on our team, certainly not everyone. Um, but most notably, we have deep expertise as a team across um, infrastructure finance, carbon markets, environmentalism and sustainability from nonprofits and for-profit ventures, um, and uh, traditional finance. So we have a really robust team that's active um, at the project level, that's um, finding, assessing, evaluating, and partnering with projects on the ground. These are often what's called nature-based projects, conservation, reforestation, afforestation. These are projects that have a measurable climate or carbon impact in that they reduce carbon from the atmosphere and they get credits issued to them in a commensurate, commensurate amount. Um, so we have an active team striking those partnerships. Um, that's what we call the supply side team. We have a, a uh, very seasoned team doing the financing associated with those projects and structuring, um, uh, structuring deals and financial products for those projects. Um, and that's our finance team. And then we have a very robust team on the demand side. So this is a team that has deep expertise in the corporate and specialty sales market, which is the spot and forward markets for buying the resulting carbon credits. Um, and the, the buyers typically are large scale corporates and we flow carbon as a company have a roster of dozens of uh, fortune 500 clients, um, key and noteworthy cultural institutions that buy their offsets from us, a lot of web three companies, um, a lot of big financial institutions have bought from us. So we, we have a, a roster of clients in the spot and forward markets as well. And then as described earlier, a key mission of ours is to bring as much of this market on chain as we can, because we think that that is the right way to scale this market and to ensure integrity and transparency and liquidity, which is key and access, et cetera. And so we have a phenomenal CTO and dev team uh, as well. Um, and there's some other great folks doing a whole variety of other functions that are not represented on this page. So let's talk about the voluntary carbon market. What is this, what is this market um, and why is it exciting? So the voluntary carbon market is distinguished from the compliance carbon market. So carbon um, can be bought, sold, traded in two different ways. One is where there's regulation or legislation that requires uh, typically corporates uh, to buy what's called allowances, meaning they are given allowances, um, enabling them to emit a certain uh, amount of greenhouse gases. And if they want to go over that, they have to purchase other companies' allowances um, from peers that haven't used up their allowances. And it's a cap and trade market. It's regulated. Um, and it's quite mature and sophisticated, primarily in Europe. That is not this market. There's another market that's known as the voluntary carbon market, which is our market. Um, and that is a market that does not exist pursuant to regulation or legislation, but rather the demand, the reason that, uh, that purchasing happens is as a result of commitments to purchasing made predominantly again by corporations because they've made a commitment related to their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, 31, and, I haven't even like thought about lunch. Oh, somebody should go on mute. <laughs> um, so uh, they've made a commitment associated with their greenhouse gas emissions. Oftentimes this looks like a net zero commitment, which means they're gonna not be a net emitter by a certain date. And what that necessitates them doing is to quantify their holistic carbon emissions, um, which includes in many cases, their supply, the emissions associated with their supply chain. So it's a very uh, scientific and um, quite an extensive undertaking to calculate all of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with their operations, especially we're talking about massive companies. They then have to um, come up with and implement um, greenhouse gas reduction strategies. And this often looks like, you know, if they have a, a fleet of vehicles, put uh, inserting in EVs. If they have, um, if they do, uh, if they have a jet, buying sustainable aviation fuel. A lot of it has to do with the source of, of their energy. So trying to swap in green energy and renewable energy sources for the energy that they use, buying renewable energy credits, et cetera. So they reduce as much as they can. And then there will always be a delta of residual emissions because there's no corporation on earth. I'd assert, I'm not gonna, I think it's a scientific fact that there's probably no corporation on earth that can 
not emit any carbon um, or can reduce down to nothing. Maybe there is, but um, for the most part, there's going to be really hard to abate residual emissions um, that do go down over time. So as more of these reduction strategies kick in, um, the, the amount of offsets required do uh, should go down over time. But nonetheless, um, there is a, a, a sort of massive, um, a massive number in the aggregate associated with either hard to abate or impossible to abate emissions. And that's where the corporation can buy um, offsets. Now, what are offsets? Now, this, now we finally get to my diagram. So on the left, it's a, it's a very simple math equation for anyone who doesn't like math. Um, for every ton of carbon that a corporation has to emit or does emit in the, uh, within their operations, um, there are projects elsewhere beyond, um, beyond their value chain, beyond their operations. There are projects elsewhere, many of them are in the developing world, that have the effect of reducing carbon from the atmosphere or removing carbon from the atmosphere. And so they buy the exact number of metric tons um, of carbon from those projects. So, uh, so that the result is, is zero or could be zero. Um, pretty simple math. I think I think I <laughs> I think I explained it. Um, so, corporation emits. They pay for a project that removes same number of tons. The result is you know no net negative um, impact or no net release of GHG um, into the atmosphere. Now, the carbon market. Uh, has a lot of questions associated with the process by which these projects um, actually uh, are issued credits, basically. So we'll go through that and we'll talk about some of the criticisms that are um, have been historically leveled at the market and why uh, those are being addressed right now, which makes this a really exciting opportunity to, uh, to, to take part in this market. So the way it works is pretty simple. A project developer, which is, it could be a nonprofit. A lot of them are actually environmental nonprofits, or it could be a for-profit project developer. Somebody, some group, some entity identifies a project that both will have the effect of reducing or removing carbon from the atmosphere, and also is not going to be financially viable if there is not going to be carbon revenue. That's a, a concept known as additionality. So an easy example would be um, there's a number of hectares of old growth carbon dense rainforest. So um, nature is per capita are probably our most scalable and cost effective carbon sinks. Um, nature, the nature that we have left, we've I think deforested something like 45% of the earth since um, before pre-industrial times, but the nature that we have left uh, has the capacity to, I've seen stats, provide something like a third of the solution to climate change. So nature is both, both among our most effective carbon sinks. And when it's destroyed, it is actually a, a pretty significant net emitter of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. So a project proponent will identify, let's say, a, a million hectares of old growth rainforest um, that they want to conserve for the climate impact. Now, the project without carbon revenue wouldn't happen. Why? Because land is incredibly value, uh, valuable when it's destroyed or degraded. Um, I, heard, uh, I heard a stat that I can't substantiate, but it's a stat that I'll share with you nonetheless. It's from a, a pretty smart VC who's active in the market, um, who said that a hectare of rainforest in the Amazon is worth something like 200 US dollars to buy in a certain location. And when you clear cut it um, for agriculture, its value goes up to 1200 US dollars per hectare. So nature is much more valuable in its destroyed and degraded state. And so, um, so without carbon revenue, without carbon credits being issued to whoever wants to buy this, uh, buy or preserve and protect this, uh, this swath of rainforest without carbon revenue, the project wouldn't happen because somebody else is gonna buy it and, and destroy it and degrade it. So the project proponent does that, um, secures sort of secures the land asset, and then has to go through a certification process, which uh, basically means collecting a lot of evidence um, about both the threat, so the additionality, proving 
or showing, demonstrating that the project wouldn't be viable without the revenue from carbon credits. And two, quantifying the amount of car the, the, the net positive impact of the project. So basically quantifying how much carbon will be um will be is 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 stored within the forest and would have been um emitted if the project didn't happen. So what is the actual scientific and mathematic uh, measurable carbon impact of the project. And again, conservation, if you're tree planting, it's a different set of calculations. Um, if you're doing a landfill gas, methane capture, biochar, there's a lot of different kinds of projects, um, but the nature ones are both um, uh, something we're passionate about at Flow Carbon um, and also a, a, a very digestible use case and example. So, um, uh, so they have to go about uh, putting together this application process um, and submitting it to a third party verification body. These are sort of standalone ver verification bodies. There's a list of them. So they're known, not anybody can be a, what's called a VVB validation verification body. Um, you submit the evidence to them. They, um, they assess and review, and then they submit it to um, a standard. Standards are um, basically, essentially global, nonprofits, there's four main ones. They are market recognized entities that have come up with these methodologies and that will take the project's evidence that again has been audited by these third party verification bodies and will again do another check and assessment that the project meets the methodology for a, you know, high, a, a um, let's call it a conservation project or an, a certifiable afforestation, reforestation, conservation project. Um, reviews the evidence, certifies the project, and then issues the project proponent carbon credits in the in the amount that the that they have demonstrated they will um, remove or reduce from the atmosphere, often on a schedule. Now, I'll run quickly through some of the criticisms that have been leveled at the market because of this process, and they basically are all our versions of something like, can you really trust the carbon impact of these projects? Um, a project claims that it is having the effect of removing, you know, let's call it 100 tons of carbon from the atmosphere, but there is a lot of questions about whether that's true or not. Now, there's a lot of answers we could spend all day um, going through different criticisms. What I think is important to note um, to note here is that this was a very tiny market for a long time. It is just starting to be um, a market that's experiencing explosive growth. And with that comes a lot of oversight, innovation, talent, capital, everything that you um, put into a market to improve it. So these methodologies by the standards, they have been dramatically improved over time. And a lot of the criticism stems from older projects that, um, that maybe were certified at a time when the methodologies weren't as strong, at a time when there wasn't as much oversight by the press, by a lot of watchdog groups, at a time when it wasn't serious corporations um, who have public disclosures about these things that were transacting in the market, but instead it was a much quieter, um, much more opaque system. So there's a lot more oversight and transparency on the form of buyers and on the form of projects. The methodologies have gotten um, uh, substantially improved at the standards. There's a lot of technology that is being brought to bear in this market in a serious way, um, like, for example, remote sensing, drone and satellite uh, monitoring of tree cover in forests, um, a lot of digital monitoring, reporting, and verification technology that's being implemented on the ground. So there's a lot of technology that's being brought to bear to improve the market as well. And um, and, and lastly, there's just a lot more um, innovation, talent, capital, um, serious financial institutions are getting involved. And so all of this has seen a dramatic improvement in the market and its credibility. There are also major market-wide integrity initiatives on both the quality of credit side. So those that are, it's called the ICBCM, the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, that's looking at um, project level um, quality assessments. And there's the, the VCMI, which is the um, Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Council, which is creating a framework for how corporates report 
on their um, offset buying. And so this is all happening at the same time. The market is dramatically um, improved from the time that a lot of the criticism stems from. The public narrative simply has not caught up yet. And there's tremendous improvement happening every day. So that's what I'll say on, on the quality question. Um, now, let's look at the market for a minute. What is this market? So you have thousands of corporates that have committed to um, basically made a commitment associated with their carbon emissions in the last 12 to 18 months. It's, it's, as, it's part of the proliferation of ESG um, commitments and broader ESG initiatives at the corporate level. Um, so you have thousands of corporations that have made emissions related commitments and many of them include today and will include offset buying. A lot of corporates are um, somewhere along the uh, the the um, the trajectory that I laid out earlier, which is they're quantifying, they're also introducing um, redu internal reduction measures, and they're starting to put together their carbon portfolios. Um, and so you can see headlines associated with this, but the real demand scenarios are changing every day because you have more and more corporates making commission uh, making commitments related to their emissions, and you have more and more of them finishing their in their quantifications and um, coming up with their strategies, their reduction strategies and seeing what the Delta is. So these demand scenarios are getting more robust and mature every day. Um, and now what the market actually looks like um, is, is really fascinating. It's, it's at a, a real inflection, um, inflection point. It was for reference, it, it was something like a $300 million market in 2018, which is you know almost not a market, um, but the market is growing rapidly. Um, by 2030, it's expect, not expected. You know, these are the, the the data comes from a lot of different places. It's a, it continues to be a very very opaque market, um, but there are estimates putting it at a 20 to 30 billion dollar market, um, and those are you know some some would view those estimates as conservative, and pricing as well has gone up dramatically um, in the last few years. So, uh, with that, I am actually going to hand over uh, the presentation to my colleague, Nick, um, who can talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing here today, what the opportunity is today. So I'm gonna um, go on mute and hand over to Nick. Great, uh, great to meet everybody um, and welcome to uh, the launch. And I uh, hope uh, Dana has answered some of the basic questions around the VCM. What I'm going to do now is essentially I'm going to transition the focus away from the broad market a little bit and then focus specific on the investment opportunity of our pilot structure. So Dana, if you can move to slide nine. So our first pool really is focused on uh, an asset called the forward contract. So before we get into the actual structure of the pilot, I think it'll be useful for everybody to understand what exactly is a forward contract in the VCL space. So that we understand at least basically what the asset collateralizing both the tin and drop actually is. So on a basic level, a forward contract in the VCM essentially is a prepayment or a commitment for credits that are unissued, but are gonna be issued sometime in the future. So usually the payments of developers and the, or sometimes they're called originators are either made all up front or partially up front or sometimes not up front at all. So payment on delivery. And that really depends on the type of developers you're working with, their liquidity and sort of the relative negotiating power of the buyer and the seller. Now, given the state of the market, um, most credits, both on the forward and spot basis, are traded on uh, what we call the OTC markets over the counter. So essentially, uh, it's bilateral transactions between a buyer and seller that doesn't really get uh, advertised in, in ex any exchange, and there's no clear price discovery on a lot of these trades that are done. So the, this opacity has actually given rise to larger spreads between uh, what the market could fetch in the spot market or in the sort of the retail and the after sale market versus what you have to actually pay the developers uh, and or the actual you know, stakeholders that develop the credits. And for an experienced developer, uh, you know, relatively short-term boards so it's a 12 to 14 month time frame is not unheard of to often secure things that are above 30% discount from spot. 
Um, but I would say 20 to 30 is probably the more sustainable spread that we usually look at when we're thinking about discounts on a sort of a 12-month forward basis. These contracts are usually uh, variable in length. You know, they can vary any from one to 10 years, depending on what type of asset you're talking about. And I would say the bulk of it probably falls between sort of one and five for most uh, foreign purchase because of the regulatory risk uh, sometimes associated with certain jurisdictions as well as uh, price risk in the VCM. Most buyers would probably come in in a short duration contract to limit their exposure. And these offsets, uh, often these contracts are issued in certain intervals, um, most frequently one year, but they can be done six month intervals as well as two years. It depends on how much the developer wants to pay for verification. So that is sort of an overview of what the actual underlying asset is. And uh, the next slide, I'm gonna talk about the actual structure and why this DeFi innovation is actually innovative for this space. Yeah, before before Nick goes on, I just wanna talk about why forward contracts are so um, important from an impact standpoint. So um, as I said earlier, nature and our nature provides our, uh, essentially our, our most cost-effective and scalable carbon sinks. Um, so like I said earlier, nature can provide up to potentially 30% of the solution to climate change. It's also a major source of global emissions when it's destroyed and degraded. Um, and we, in order to meet what the global community has agreed upon as the sort of pathway to avoiding catastrophic climate change, we have to stop destroying these natural carbon sinks. Um, it's it's absolutely essential. Um, the uh, And that, that hasn't happened yet because it is so incredibly valuable to destroy and degrade nature. Now, project developers, those who identify these projects, often have a gap, a time gap of about, it could be two to three years. Um, it's often something like 18 months to uh, 18 to 24 months before they achieve issuance of carbon credits and can sell them in the market. So they have to bootstrap these projects, which are often incredibly capital intensive, for years sometimes. And because of that, this is a funding bottleneck that has fundamentally prevented this market from scaling. So the market is both dramatically supply constrained given the corporate demand scenarios that are now coming online given these commitments that I outlined earlier. So it is a supply constrained market, but a key bottleneck to generating new supply is the fact that these carbon developers um, have years until they get the actual unit that they can sell for revenue. And it is hard to finance these projects in traditional ways because they're um, not well understood, they're often risky, they're in the developing world, um, et cetera. And so solving this financing bottleneck is something that we um, that, that will scale the market in a really significant way. And forward contracts, which is what Nick is describing here, is a key, a key mechanism for doing that. So you take a project that hasn't yet gotten its issuance of carbon credits. It's somewhere in that you know 24 month process. Um, it's the ability to identify that this is a project that will get to issuance. You know, you obviously that takes expertise and an analysis of the project and the project developer, et cetera. That's where the expertise of the originator comes in, which is us. Um, but it's saying this project will get to issuance and we should pre somebody should pre purchase or finance these not yet issued credits essentially. So, um, that, that's this forward, con uh, forward contract construct that we're describing. Um, back to you, Nick. Yeah, thank, thanks for the Dana. So, yeah, on to the slide 10. So I think like building on everything Dana said, right? Um, Fords is a very conventional way uh, for developers to tap liquidity before they actually have credits to sell. But why, why do we need to introduce DeFi into this? If we already kind of have this Ford mechanism that's you know quasi-working. Well, I think one is because the demand for upfront financing is so large, the way the Fords are being arranged and traded through OTC today just simply is not sufficient to meet the climate change problem that we are facing. So what essentially is happening today, you have developers of all sizes, so small, medium, large, that are essentially negotiating through really long B2B sell cycles with major corporate buyers. And you know the, 
big ones among there. So the big oil majors, the airlines, as well as the broker and trader and funds that actually, you know, uh, trade and play in this market. So they would have to go through these negotiating processes individually with these counterparties, go through legal due diligence, go through extensive sales processes in order to actually get one of these four contracts signed. And that's a very long process. And then the data requirements uh, from different buyers are going to be different. So you're going to have five data rooms with five different buyers. You're going to have five different processes for five different buyers. And often they're going to quote you different prices for the same project. So it's very inefficient, actually, for developers to try to sell their um, credits on a forward basis if they don't have a substantial marketing budget and or they already have a consultant on file which is a huge deterrent, especially for small projects and then sort of the global south and emerging markets, in which they don't have a lot of upfront capital to put at risk and actually hire these consultants and actually run these processes. So that's why we think DeFi and specifically the center view opportunity is so interesting. What we're doing is building a centralized facility to buy uh, Fords from developers of all sizes. So we're leveling the playing field for small, medium, and large developers, looking for clarity of data requirements, uh, clarity of underwriting rules, and ease of access for liquidity when they sell their uh, credits on a forward basis. So this graphic essentially is, you know, explaining what happens today versus what's happening uh, with the centrifuge uh, innovation. So essentially what happens today is developers would negotiate these OTC contracts with buyers. It takes a really long time, like I said, uh, and it could take uh, a lot of resources. What's possible in the future is through our uh, partnership with Centrifuge, this centralized DeFi fund essentially would serve as a single offering for developers in the future so that they don't actually have to interface directly with the, uh, the buyers themselves. The buyers would cut buy their credits from the facility and then developers will sell the credits to the facility, and the facility will serve as a central clearing mechanism for forward credits. And in the future, the idea is to build a number of these pools to represent different slices of the carbon market so that um, folks developing nature-based projects, engineer solutions, blue carbon projects can all have a way to sell their credits in a very clear, transparent, and easy to use way. And it opens up access to the public investor, which is this community that we're talking to here is traditionally BCM has been an institutional player space with very high barriers of entry. So for the first time, we think not ever, but at least definitely one of the few opportunities we're seeing for investors to get exposure to the BCM is through this facility on small, smaller ticket sizes and easy, easier to digest uh, you know, uh, individual investment positions. And they now get exposure to VCM through this without having to incur a huge uh, cost to set up all the infrastructure necessary to trade the existing legacy products. So next, uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the first project. So this first project is our way of gently introducing the carbon asset to the community. We understand that the VCM is relatively new, especially on chain. Um, so we want to de-risk the pool as much as possible and make the data on the project as transparent as possible and make the economics on this as transparent as possible so that investors can make their choices on whether to invest in the market, which we think are very exciting, obviously. Um, but, you know, you can sort of pick and choose your risk appetite, you know, whether you want to play in a drop in the tin. So all the numbers we're, we're trying to make is as basically as transparent as possible. The collateral underlying the first pool is a Chaco Forest Protection Project. So it's in Paraguay. Essentially, it is a conservation project that is mitigating the deforestation pressures in the Chaco Forest region in the Paraguay that is currently being harmed by um, a lot of uh, palm oil related uh, deforestation, as well as just general uh, deforestation for economic means, and is a very, very sensitive part of uh, the forest that has a lot of species of animals in there that are endangered and needs quite a bit of protection. So we think from an environmental perspective, this is a very high integrity project. And this project is uh, basically being verified through the VCS, so the Bureau of Carbon Standard, which is the leading uh, Vera, sort of the leading carbon standard out there, representing about 80% of the market. In addition to the VCS, it is also undergoing CCB certification, which is essentially an extra quality check 
uh, on the community benefits of this project. So this project not only offers carbon mitigation benefits, but also offers co-benefits such as doing well for the community and offering employment, as well as social benefits to the stakeholders that are there. Um, and in terms of potential economics, I mean, obviously we uh, are very confident in the quality of this project, and we're very confident that the, the price of carbon globally has to go up in order for climate change problem to be addressed. But this market, uh, you know, we are seeing some tangible numbers in terms of where this is falling, because it is a VCS CTB project. There are quite a bit of benchmarking out there that's done in some of the projects, and we expect something like this, which is sort of vintage 20 and 21. Um, and I'm going to the, the vintage concept in the VCM essentially means the year in which the, the actual mitigation activity has happened. That is the year of the vintage, and usually the market treats newer vintages with premiums. Um, so the vintage 20 and 21 means that the vintages coming out of this project is actually quite new. Uh, so they should pet, fetch a premium compared to some of the, you know, the 2018, 2017, or 2019 vintages out there, even for the same type of project in South America. So on a conservative estimate, uh, obviously we as originator and both monetization agents on this first pilot pool will do the best to maximize value on these credits. But in terms of market benchmarking, we're seeing probably between 11 to 14 dollars for these credits once they're issued. And the economics on this uh, for the pilot pool, the drop tranche we're offering 15 percent on the drop tranche, and for the tin tranche, we think the MOIC on this, given that uh, credits are going to be issued in November and going to be sold in November, are going to be pretty healthy as well, given the low prices we have actually originated the asset for, and. Um, the idea is for us, low carbon, to continue to do this, originate at a, at a low cost, and then monetize at a higher value by focusing purely on originating high quality projects and working with maybe other originators and developers with a good track record to keep finding these projects and delivering value to investors in this pool. So I'm going to get a little bit into the actual structure. I'm going to go quickly um, in the interest of time. But essentially, it's a very simple structure for the first pilot. Uh, the VERPA, so the, the four contract, which is you know usually called a VERPA in the space, uh, Voluntary Emission Reduction Purchase Agreement, uh, has already been signed with the developer. So the credits themselves are about 85,000 credits split between a 2020 vintage and 2021 vintage. And they're going to be issued in late October to early November. And they're going to be sold sometime in November to the market for cash. And we, as Flow Carbon, when we originated this asset from the developer, we have already paid about 500,000 to secure the, the, the agreement from the developer. And the remaining about 345,000 will be paid once the credits are actually issued. And we're bringing this entire contract on chain through Centrifuge. So the collateral underlying both the tin and the drop is the entire 85,000 carbon credits to be issued. And we're issuing the structure under a sort of 70 30 split, 70% of it being tin, uh, sorry, 70% being drop and then 30% being tin. And really for us, uh, you know, we are highly confident this market and this asset specifically is going to perform. So that's you know why we put in this structure. But to offer sort of investors additional comfort, we're basically stipulating that we'll retain at least a third of the tin tranche to give uh, investors comfort that we're going to have retaining skin in the game in this, the performance of these carbon credits. And the way this is going to work, once these credits are issued, low carbon will serve as the marketing agent for these credits. So we would essentially bring the issued credits to market through our corporate relationships, as well as the spot market to transact and convert these credits into cash. And that cash essentially is the source of revenue to pay back both the TIN and the drop investors. And under this scenario, these numbers here, we're assuming about a $12 uh, credit price when actually uh, sold and monetized. So next slide. So looking forward, um, and again, in the interest of time, not detail on the pipeline, but suffice to say this pilot of 845,000 is not where our ambitions end. This is where it starts. So the idea is to really let the community uh, gain comfort around both the structure but as well as the carbon asset 
as an asset class. Once that has, has been established and the censorship community has you know, had a little bit of time to get comfort around the asset class, we plan to scale this quite aggressively so that this truly becomes a tool of choice for developers who are actually seeking liquidity in the foreign market. So, you know, the current target, and this is the moving target, obviously, it depends on sort of how quickly we can originate these assets uh, and how quickly we can do our due diligence, but we're seeing uh, very, very strong demand from the corporate side for credits. So, you know, these numbers are probably on the conservative side, but we are looking by Q1 of 2023, likely to do between five to 10 deals, uh, sort of between $3 million per deal type check sizes or between sort of 15 and $30 million in aggregate pool size by Q1 of 2023. And the idea is for us not to act as the lone originator in this space. After the pilot, we're actively bringing supply partners, other originators and other developers with good track records, good supply access and good relationships in an emerging markets in the global south to bring other quality assets into this fold so that we are not being the bottleneck to this facility. And we were really trying to scale this as quickly as possible. Um, and yeah, the right, some of the projects that, that we have highlighted, we have a lot more than this, but this is just a highlight of what we're looking at. We're very globally diversified uh, in terms of source of uh, projects. We have both access to South American projects, African projects, but also in the OECD. So Ireland, Scotland, as well as some of the US based and Canadian based projects as well in the forestry sector. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it back to Dana uh, and then to talk a little bit about our upcoming event and kind of wrap up the session. And then looking forward to sort of Q&A and answering any questions that the community has on our structure. Thanks, Nick. Um, first of all, Nick deserves a little bit of a round of applause because he managed to stay with stable internet and great audio, even though he's on a project site in West Africa right now. So. <laughs> um, Good job, Nick and Nick's internet. Um, okay, so um, we are getting ready for Climate Week here in New York City, where we are hosting the official Climate Week Blockchain Summit. And so if anybody is New York based or wants to come in, we would love to host you at the Blockchain Summit. We're gonna have a, a whole day of substantive um, panel discussions, one-on-one -on -one conversations that focus on project finance and carbon finance um, in the voluntary carbon market and how that um, is scaled most efficiently and effectively on blockchain. Um, and obviously a big focal point will be our partnership with, um, with the centrifuge community. So um, we'd love to have any of you there. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and I think we could probably launch into the Q&A. The only closing thought that I'll, I'll state is what I alluded to earlier, which is from an impact standpoint, the voluntary carbon market um, is both rapidly gaining, um, gaining the tools and the innovation and capital needed to really, really um, address some of the historical um, questions about the quantification of the climate impact of these projects. Um, honestly, we as a we as a, a global society have um, in the last 10 years or so developed the technology to improve lots of industries and these kinds of projects and their monitoring and their quantification is no exception. And so um, as these get rolled out and implemented and high quality supply um, can be scaled from an integrity standpoint, it is essential that we capitalize this market at the outset, meaning at the, the project finance stage so that we could meet the um, growing demand on the corporate side. And then it becomes a flywheel of as much carbon uh, climate impact as our natural ecosystems can support, which is vast. Um, feeding this corporate demand as they implement their own um, ESG programs, which it's super important to state and can't be overstated enough, only includes offsets as a tiny component of their overall strategies, right? This is not, this is not an opportunity for um, corporations to um, ignore internal reductions. On the contrary, th these are um, becoming increasingly visible and in some cases regulated disclosures and 
they are absolutely taking their own quantification and internal reduction of GHG emissions very seriously and have to. And the offsetting is um, the sort of third step, but it is the step that will enable us to finally preserve the remaining um, carbon sinks that we actually have um, in our natural ecosystems. So with that, we can, we can go over to Q&A. Uh, Dana, Dana, there is a, um, this is Janice from Centrifuge. Uh, I think there's a question from Kianga, but I think her question is around like, maybe just sizing of projects, right? Is there a smallest number that you look at? Yeah, it's a good question. So the size of projects, um, the, the, and Nick, you can weigh in if you, you know, want to add to what I say, but essentially, um, the size of a project, you can either, if it's a, if it's a land-based project, you could look at the number of hectares, right? The actual physical size of the project, or you could look at the carbon, like how much carbon is going to come off of a project, right? And that I think is the more probably from a financing standpoint, the more relevant metric. So, um, really that has to be weighed against the cost of getting the project to, um, to, essentially to issuance where they can recover costs. So how capital intensive is the project and what is the expected carbon output so that the revenue can be modeled and the ROI can be assessed. And there are costs in between um, associated with getting the project to issuance. And so um, it really just needs to be either break even or ROI positive in order for it to make sense. But the, the time of the, like, of the financing is, is, is the real bottleneck here. But Nick, if you want to add to that. Yeah, so I, I, that is a great question. So usually these projects have to be a certain size in order for the developer to actually do it because there's actually a lot of fixed costs to get an air bike through the rest of trees. So in terms of fixed costs, just to give the community a little bit of a color on this is, you know, you're talking about between uh, 250000 to half a million dollars to get validated and verified depending on which stage of the project you are already at. And sometimes those numbers can go up depending on how challenging the terrain actually is to send folks in to actually do measurements and how good the data is already captured. So in terms of check sizes, anything less than half a million is not really worth uh, the developers seeking liquidity on. So that's why we're often seeing uh, asks for something that is 12 months from issuance, somewhere between uh, 500 to $3 million. So I think that is kind of the sweet spot that we're looking for. Obviously, for this facility, we'll be focused on projects that are between one to three million. But like I said in the beginning, we really try to lower um, the barrier of entry for smaller projects. So to the extent that there are projects out there that um, are smaller and uh, they just need that extra little bit of capital to get them over the line, and they just need something quick um, to finance them the gap, we're you know, happy to look at those projects as well because Fundamentally, this uh, the innovation of this facility really is about clarity of underwriting standards, and then the clarity of what data we will need from the developer. So the our process of underwriting should be less expensive and less laborious than you know them going to a traditional buyer or a traditional corporate or a traditional fund. So um, we should be able to accommodate small projects. I would say. It looks like there was another question from Matthew in the chat. Um, can you explain how an investor can make money in the Chapo example if we're assuming carbon credit prices rise from 12 from the current nine? Yeah, so the nine is, the basically the origination cost of this pool is around 9.9. .9. So we originated these credits at around sub 10 levels. So I would say these credits are not trading at nine. Definitely the vintage 20 and 2021s with CCB and this level of impact, definitely north of 10. So if the carbon prices move, you know, basically beyond 11, you would see, you know, the additional equity value to create to 10, just like any other pool. And the, the drop investors would accrete their 15% on the pool. Um, but I would say, yeah, you know, you invest in this to basically get exposure to the VCM. So, uh, you know, we believe that this asset is high quality. We believe that the VCM is, you know, has gone through, I would say, a volatile period in Q4 2021, but it is on its way to recovery. 
And it does have uh, quite a bit of buffer in that we originated these credits sort of sub 10 for something this new or the vintage. So that's kind of where that economics for the investor comes in is the difference between our origination costs and what these would have fetched to the spot market. For the record, the VCM is the voluntary carbon market. So it's the name of the market. I, I guess I'm, I'm still just confused, like how a token buyer captures these economics aside from just speculating on the price of carbon credit like isn't the the value proposition here is that you're bringing like additional efficiencies to the market so like the cost of uh, issuing should go down and if you can share some of that with token holders like in a quantifiable way it becomes interesting but if it's just oh we think carbon price is going to go up by this specific issuance then I, i'm i'm less convinced i guess yeah, so I think it's the value proposition for the investor really is it offers two different ways to play the car market, right? Um, so there is the drop, which essentially you're getting fixed yield on a carbon asset, which is quite rare, right? You don't, as smaller investors, you actually get that opportunity to do that. And this is one of those opportunities that you can actually access this sort of fixed yield uh, instrument that's collateralized by carbon. So that's one way to do it. So I would say if you're looking for yield, that's one way for you to, to really have a yield product backed by carbon. And on the equity side, it really is about your views on the carbon market. So you know, if you're bullish on the carbon market, I think Tim would appeal to you because that is direct exposure to the price of the carbon market. But if you're not, then I, I don't think the Tim is the right instrument for you. And the beauty of this is, the, tip, the, the drop is collateralized in such a way that there is a buffer of 30% on the tin side. So there is quite a bit of comfort for people just looking to lend to the carbon market in the over collateralization of the drop, I would say, in this carbon pool. And what underpins the yield? What underpins the yield is the, the, the intrinsic value of the carbon credits. So for example, if you assume the carbon credits have an intrinsic value of $11, that $11, for, to the extent that it's over the origination price, is going to offer uh, economics to the TIN investor. But to the extent it drops below the origination price, it has to drop in such a way that it impairs the entire collateral of the TIN before it hits the drop. So that the intrinsic value of the, the, the carbon credit is actually what gives rise to both the drop in the TIN in terms of economics. But the draw has this extra comfort of having the tin buffer to basically take the risk and the volatility of any pricing movement in the vol voluntary carbon market. Other questions? Hey there. hey there, this is uh, Jay. Um, I do see one question in the chat. Um, how small is too small for a project? Uh, yeah, like, like I said, I think most of these projects wouldn't be done if uh, these, these credits that are issued don't even justify the cost of verification. So if you're talking about um, the fixed cost of around $250,000, the project really have to basically earn, you know, at least five hundred thousand dollars of economics in order for that to, have, to actually have any merit. And then there's operation costs around that. So I would say, how small a project is too small. I have actually not seen any projects in which, uh, you know, twelve months away from issuance, they're looking for anything less than half a million dollars. Uh, that being said, I think. It is possible um, and it's definitely feasible for a project developer to basically chop up their Ford uh, credit into a number of different slices and tell, sell these small slices to different investors. I think it's uh, quite painful to do that, but it is possible. So, you know, it is, I would say, conceivable that there could be a developer out there selling 10,000 lots of credits to the centrifuge pool if they think the pricing here is, is competitive with what they're uh, other seeing. Uh, so I don't think it's not necessarily the, the project size, it's how small they want to slice their sort of four positions in order to sell it to the buyers. Um, so it's hard to say, but I would say, you know, on a per project basis, you definitely don't see anything with check size that's kind of smaller than half a million, usually.
Anything else? Well, we could either take the law school approach and start cold calling on people to force questions, or we can uh, we can call it. So if anyone's got any final questions, um, we welcome them. We can answer anything about this market, about this vehicle and this structure. Um, I will say that one of the big innovations here could be um, basically scaling this facility for lots of smaller projects that are really high quality and high impact, but don't um, have the size to secure the financing that they need in the traditional market. That's a That's been a constant, since we announced this partnership with Centrifuge, it's been a, a constant feedback that we've gotten that there are globally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of project developers doing smaller scale projects that are looking for a scalable facility that they can access in the aggregate together. And so um, it, that, that's what this looks like um, at scale. That's what we're, you know, doing with this community. Yeah, so I think that's accurate, right? Because the half a million dollar number I gave, I think is what kind of what we're seeing in the market, but we're really hoping that once we roll this out, that uh, to the extent it's worth the, the effort to actually develop smaller projects on the developer side, uh, they can actually tap this facility to actually be more efficient with the capital so that they can, uh, you know, get cash quicker and actually develop projects faster. So we're really inviting developers all over the world, especially on a smaller side, to think of the centrifuge community and think of this facility specifically as a way for them to tap financing without incurring a lot of time cost and the resource intensive processes actually run the capital process and see this as a quick way for them to get their projects off the ground. Yeah, there is a question I see in the chat from Vincent, which says, if everything goes well, um, how many loans do you think you could be originating in one to two years? Um, so I think we have a stat about that on the slide, but Nick, you can you can answer. Yeah, so I think in the near term, so I would say in the six months time frame, we definitely want to do between five to 10 deals. So in two years time, that's vastly going to be bigger than that. So it's really going to be uh, constrained, I would say, by both the capital, uh, so the continued interest of investors into this facility as a viable way to finance projects, which we think there is very strong interest definitely from this community. But uh, you know, generally, on-chain capital as a source of capital, we think there's going to be a lot of interest in funneling a lot of capital into green assets. So we really hope to do, grow this community. But I think it's really going to be about uh, bringing other developers in here, right? Like we, as Flow Carbon, we're only so many people, but the VCM has a lot of other traditional developers and uh, suppliers, which are new to the on-chain community and new to the on-chain capital ecosystem. So we're building a lot of partnerships with those folks to basically get them comfortable with the idea of utilizing uh, the on-chain community's capital to actually fund these projects. So after these partnerships are made, we hope to really grow this in, 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 in quite substantial ways and we'll be doing a lot more than sort of 10 deals in six months. Okay, um, I see another question came in in the chat. Um, what I think we'll start with the second half of the question, which is what are the factors that we look at when evaluating um, deals? And so there's a lot of variables that go into an assessment of a project. It includes um, obviously the carbon potential of the project, um, the uh, the likelihood that the project is meeting the requirements for whatever methodology it's going to be certified under, um, the quality of the project, quality and history of the project developer that is actually on the ground doing the project, the geolocation in which the project is happening, both from a um, historical it, variables related to the project type. So for example, historical deforestation rates in that geo, um, political and social stability in the region um, and in the project site, uh, 
Engagement with local communities is a big one because that's often either required under methodologies or other additional certifications. Um, it, it, it's an important variable. Um, any that I'm missing, Nick? What else can we add to the list? Yeah, so I think essentially three main pillars that we look at. Um, so there is pricing, obviously. How cheap can we originate these assets uh, at? That's going to have a direct impact on the return on investment for the investors in this facility. So obviously, the more negotiating we do, the more successful in getting the discounts on the front end, the more economic it is for the investor and for the originator. That's one, the pricing. Two is the environmental benefit and impact. And that usually has to do with assessing the carbon baseline. So whether something conforms to the methodology and how real are the impacts being qualified. So a lot of that comes down to assessing wh whether the forest has been mapped correctly, whether the baseline for the reference regions are being selected properly, and whether um, the activities that are being claimed on the social side are actually happening. So sometimes that's hiring third party auditors, sometimes that's you know, actually knowing the developer and flying down to do site audits. So there's a lot of that. Third, I think about regulatory. This is fundamentally a regulatory asset, right? It's, it's a digital asset that is based on a set of rules. So uh, picking the right countries is key. So you, know, you don't want to be in a jurisdiction in which the carbon rules are fuzzy so that uh, the credits are, you're, you're buying could be basically eliminated through a stroke of a pet. So you want to do your homework in terms of you know, whether these jurisdictions have a long history of allowing, permitting, and um, yeah, allowing, permitting, and, and, and basically fostering the private carbon community, as well as uh, any clarity around sort of their treatment of private carbon rights, essentially, in their country. So I would say those are the three main pillars when you actually look at the projects. Anything else? I think if there's nothing else, Dana, Nick, uh, we typically run these for an hour. Great. So we're a little bit over already. Um, should we maybe uh, let the folks know here to uh, that they can reach you on the forum um, as needed? You can also go to Tin Lake centrifuge.io to start investing in the pools right now. Um, same as usual, the job is 5K minimum. And then if you want to invest in tin, you have to click the click the link in the website, um, send an email, and then get the doc signed. And then we'll whitelist the tin addresses um, manually as, as usual. Um, thank you so much, Dana, Nick, um, and the rest of the Flow Carbon team. This has been great. I've learned a lot. Um, and then I look forward to a successful launch uh, today. Amazing. Thank you so much to the community. We're thrilled to be partnering with you. Um, we're obviously very passionate about both the opportunity and the impact here and um, could not ask for better, more, uh, I would say, more ambitious and innovative and forward thinking um, partners than the centrifuge community. So we're really happy to be here. We appreciate you taking the time to listen and are excited to do really impactful things together. Yeah, Th thanks everybody for taking the time. It's, uh, we're very passionate about the project. We're very passionate about what we're doing and we're very excited about finally building a product that allows uh, investors to actually access and to get exposure to the market. So, you know, thanks for taking the time to learn about the market. And uh, yeah, hopefully if you have any questions, just please reach out.